Hello, welcome to Fiber Track. My name is Sarah. Welcome, you are most welcome. I have been very busy in the studio here in Northern Maine, and I can't wait to share with you the quilting, the surface design, the art journaling, cyanotype that I have been endeavoring over the past couple weeks. There's a lot to get through here, and I am really excited to share with you some of the experimenting. I go into depth a little bit this time about my quilts, about where I want to go with quilting. I also definitely include some very slightly boring updates on my knitting. All the same, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. Appalachian sunrise meets my skin Even with my eyes still closed, I can feel it coming in Golden, golden, I'll follow home Golden, 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 golden thing in spring rainbow trout and hummingbird wing golden I'll follow them golden so let's talk about cyanotypes this is a deep rabbit hole I'm spiraling down aside from gathering items to make prints with you are going to need the cyanotype sensitizer and I've included some turmeric here I have my frames that I stole glass and some cardboard from, and I am using Canson cold press watercolor paper, as there is a lot of wet medium in this. I used binder clips to push my glass and boards together, and I'm gonna just take you a little bit through the process. These papers are dry. So this is a dry cyanotype, kind of. I found a number of tutorials on YouTube that I am just riffing on here. Um, I'm adding a vinegar solution, turmeric, bubbles. So while my paper started out dry, I am adding wet elements. Now you can do something called wet cyanotypes where you start with wet medium. Um, and all of this is going to create varying tones on blue and white. So I've uh, used salt here, and again, this is all experimentation. I don't know how this entered into my radar. Maybe it was through Pinterest, but I have it bad. And I felt this way when I did botanical dyeing at my Wolf Scout retreat with ninja chickens maria muscarella who does a lot of eco printing and it was like i think it had to do with the reveal i was so excited to see how things would turn out and i just kept creating different um you know uh, amalgamations of turmeric or the or the salt or what have you and here it is so I am not patient enough to wait for this to oxidize on its own, which you can do. I would take out the printed elements. You are supposed to rinse the chemical off of your paper. And then I like to dip mine in hydrogen peroxide, which instantaneously adds oxygen and creates that brilliant blue, right? So it's just like magic. If you are familiar with indigo dyeing, then you understand the magical moment of going from green to the blue. And here we go, can't quite get enough. These are so addictive, as I explained before. 
Now, a couple things. I would hang mine in the house, but I did find some of the excess chemical did drip off and it can stain. So I have shifted my whole studio way of doing this as far as doing it outside. Rob has kind of built me an outdoor sink so that I'm not so concerned about using our household areas. While the sensitizer is considered non-toxic, isn't it nice to not have to worry about putting down paper and staining your floors? So you can see I had not perfected my whole setup and process, but having a mat and a dimly lit area of the house is really helpful. Any light contamination is going to shift that sensitizer very quick. So I took my fabric, which I had washed in a pH neutral detergent, and I soaked it in the chemical. It doesn't really take that much chemical, and the sensitizer I bought, which is potassium, potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate, part A and part B, you mix. Um, you can get a lot of prints out of the two bottles. So this would be considered a wet cyanotype. I went right from soaking the fabric to a placement of objects. And I'm going to add turmeric and salt and vinegar, all sorts of different um, items to create different levels of blue and, um, and you get gold from the turmeric, as I mentioned. So it's so fun uh, for a very minimal investment um, with some you know, scraps of fabric. You can use fabric that has a print on it. And this investment from Jacquard, uh, you can really have some fun over the summer. Now, collecting items goes without saying probably stick to your yard or known area or where you have permission and known species. Um, also, I wanted to highlight um, that this particular piece is strictly the cyanide, uh, strictly the cyanotype formula, and I do need to rinse it. Um, I finished all of them in a hydrogen peroxide bath. There's a lot of information on Pinterest, YouTube, and on the Jacquard site. You can tone all of these with tea and tannin. The world is your oyster when it comes to working with this particular dye, and it is considered permanent. So we'll see where this all goes. I'm really excited to keep going with this this summer, so stay tuned. So surface design is obviously a running theme and I'm having so much fun with all the different mediums and being able to explore pan pastels and inks and dyes and cyanotypes. And one of the ways I'm trying to focus that is by cr I'm creating some boundaries around my thoughts and interpretation. A group of friends and, my, and I are listening to Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, her lectures, Mother Night. You can find them on Sounds True and Audible. And for each chapter, I am creating a journal page. And so while I'm listening to her lectures, I am taking notes and understanding and creating references and images. And the foundation for that is really going to start with the background. In this particular chapter, she was talking about the comforting shadow, and I think that was Santo, Santo Umbra. Um, I could be wrong, I don't have my notes. So I am thinking about not only the comforting shadow of um, weight, but I'm thinking about here as well the concept of resurrection, which was also part of the, the conversation and the storytelling. I would recommend these to you if you're a fan of Dr. Estes and her written works, uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. I really enjoy her lectures. She has an amazing gift for storytelling and a transportative element to not only the stories, but the bigger spiritual pieces that she brings up for reflection. In this particular work, I'm using water-based ink stains from Tim Holtz. and 
because I am thinking about this idea of a golden feather, I pulled out my gold leaf and, or gold foil, if you will. And so I really wanted to pull in metallics. That's pretty normal for me. I also played around with these National Geographics and Citrusol. Are you familiar with that? I created some journal pages by putting Citrusol on the National Geographics and it creates um, this chemical reaction where all of the inks run together. And so I was pulling some of those pages in. I will be, I think, sh highlighting that probably on my Patreon page for people to see how that works. And this is just an opportunity to kind of see how things get auditioned. Um, not only do I want to pull in color and form and uh, metallics and different mediums, inks, gold foil, magazines. Um, I'm also thinking about um, uh, text, right? How to use text within these. Uh, so it. It's a really nice exercise, not just being kind of a blank canvas because you're working with, um, you know, the, the concepts and ideas. And I like the way that creates a framework. And so you, you know, I knew I wanted to, I knew the word golden was important and feather. And that's kind of where I started. So I had shadow, golden, feather, uh, and that's kind of, what I, where I started to build. So I'm pulling out all of those pieces, surface design that I had worked on, all of my pens, um, scraps. I know I'm saving all of my scraps. One of the most important uh, pieces of text that I took away was uh, by Wendell Berry, her reference to the poet and writer and farmer, um, Wendell Berry, which was practice resurrection. Um, and that was really um, my takeaway. So you can see the heat here, the golden feather representing the self, the comforting shadow, and the constant flame that is, um, is us. I know, I'm getting very deep. That's where she, she takes me there. Um, so this, again, just grabbing images, working on balance. Um, so there's the physical piece of that, there's the creative eye that's working, and there's the cognitive subconscious that's working here. And um, it's a really great way to spend an hour um, getting everything out and just kind of getting down to it. Um, thumbing through stuff, ripping up stuff. You know, I love having ink-stained hands at the end of the day. It's also important for me to reference other works and to incorporate other important poems or passages. So I like to use that text space to fill in. And in this instance, I'm pulling from Women Who Run With The Wolves, but I had also pulled The Prophet. So again, you're working with lots of different mediums and thoughts. We'll see where this goes. I was really pleased with the way that this page turned out and I will keep you up to date on the next chapter. You might remember I have been working on the Clava Quilt by Miss May. This is a design based on a Bronze Age site in the Highlands of Scotland and I was really taken by the line uncorked from Wyndham Fabrics. The colors were really rich, it was fun to play with gradients and I love the metallic elements in each of the colors. So I decided to do, as you might remember, a blue moon phase and a gold moon phase. I finished the gold moon phase and I needed to do the blocks for the other two. So these blocks are not heavily pieced, but as you can see, they are circular. And again, while I uh, was able to maintain, um, you know, a fair amount of the finished size. Uh, I was not in the precision category of quilters. Again, I'm not entering this into any fairs. It's strictly for my enjoyment. 
Um, and overall, when it was finished, I was really quite pleased with how it came out. You can't really tell that some things were off or that I stretched the fabric a little bit to meet it here or um, that the seams didn't nest. And I have to make some decisions about the quilting for this, whether I will hand quilt it, which I'm leaning heavily towards. All the same, that will be a project for the fall. And I can't wait to kind of do this one again. In case you're wondering what is going to happen next, here is a sneak peek at the ballerina block, which I am going to complete out of the Wild Coast fabric line from Birch Organics. This happens to be on sale right now at fabricworm.com if you're interested in pursuing something similar. In the meantime, let's see what this looks like. So I thought I would talk to you a little bit about the quilting endeavors, which has seemed to have t overtaken um, the majority of my creative space and making the past couple weeks and months. And that being said, I have finished th two, three quilts since April. My mother, the clava, which you saw, and the rippling star, which I show, um, showed in the last vlog. Um, and I also finished a uh, work in progress, the Orkney Grove. So one, two, three, four quilts um, have been finished in the past four months. Uh, I've got a few more that are all planned um, and ready to kind of move through this hurricane that is the summer of quilts. I'm feeling really motivated to get done the projects that are planned. So. The ballerina, for example, I purchased the Wild Coast by Birch Fabrics last summer and I wanted to make ballerina. I found those two together. Uh, that was a project. I have a project by Debbie Maddie with one of her pattern lines. That's a project. And I purchased a panel, um, which is not like me, but these animals were so funny. Um, they're like little winter animals, squirrels, foxes um, that have scarves on and I just thought that was really whimsical and fun. So that's a project. And then the last project is a William and Morris um, group of pattern, group of fabrics that I purchased to do the Orkney plaid quilt. So those are kind of the four pieces that are, you know, big cuts of fabric that aren't scrappy per se, um, scrap pieces. So I've got the ballerina on the go. As I said, this is a quilt by Jaybird. Uh, I almost said Jaybird Knits, but Jaybird Quilts. Um, I like this and I like her aesthetic because I tend to gravitate towards fabrics that have large illustrative motifs on them and I want to be able to see them. They don't lend themselves to small pieced traditional patchwork. So her kind of modern aesthetic opens up the door to working with bigger pieces that allow um, 
kind of the story and the narrative and the motifs of the fabric to shine through a little bit better. I kind of ran into that a little bit with the Rippling Star um, on the smaller version because it would cut off big chunks of the patterning and you wouldn't really get a feel for the overall fabric. So, um, so I, I'm looking forward to working on this particular piece. Um, the other thing that I have um, that I'm working on, as you saw with the cyanotypes, is kind of doing some surface design for my own um, fabrics. And so with that in mind, I have a couple ideas. One is to kind of create my own quilt basics or perhaps use um, some of the Jaybird quilt patterns uh, to showcase that surface design work. So, um, so I have found these patterns to be uh, to lend themselves to my choices. Um, I do have a very traditional style. You might be familiar with Edita Sitar of Laundry Basket Quilts. I have a number of episodes that are not featured on YouTube that are actually featured on the Vimeo site um, when I took a hiatus from YouTube. And I talk about Edita Sitar and my aspirations for her quilting, which is very precise. Ah, there's that word. Um, and traditional stars, um, that type of piecing. So I have quite a bit of fabric I purchased um, when I was looking at wanting a scrappy feel um, to include in my grandmother's scraps that I inherited. So, um, so that's kind of hanging out here in the creative periphery. Um, but for now, I'm enjoying powering through some of these quilts um, and, and working on these fabrics. I am, as I said, thinking about my own surface design and how to incorporate that. Um, so there's a lot going on with material. Um, material, isn't it hard to like be a person who makes a lot of stuff and now like my family all has everything they need and um, I, you know, I just, I don't need any more quilts. Rob doesn't need another quilt. We have the wood stove, we have the sweaters, we have the quilts. So I'm tr starting to really get um, focused. Is that the right word? Um, I'm looking for ways to enjoy um, the quilt making process, but perhaps not at the same pace. And so that's making me start to think about the smaller piecing and also about hand piecing. I wonder about hand piecing and I could um, create more precision for some of the quilts by Edita Sitar, um, which have teeny tiny little pieces and, um, and I find it hard to manipulate them on the machine. So those are some of the thoughts that are going around in my head. I did order some backing fabrics um, that are coming and I ordered um, some fabrics to make a table runner for a friend who was going through a difficult time. And I have aspirations to make lap quilts for each of my niece and nephew um, in the upcoming year. Um, and at some point I think I'll probably upgrade their bed quilts to something a little bit more mature. So. I still have quilts to do. It's just the pace again. I've I've just been, you know, moving through this um, material, which makes me really happy. It's creating a lot of scraps. So then I'm like thinking about how to pull all these scraps together. But that's for another episode. Um, let's see. Was there anything else? Oh, the last thing I know I've spoken a little bit about the clava quilt um, during the voiceover, but I am thinking about hand quilting that and I will keep you posted as my brain kind of mulls around on, um, on what to do, how I want to do it, basting, the whole thing. So that's its own special <laughs> uh, endeavor and set of skills that I'm going to have to explore and work on a little bit more. Right. So the knitting. Well, I have worked on the cardin sweater. What? I know. What sweater is that? Uh, I've worked on that and I've worked on the fox sweater. So as far as the cardin goes, I have knit the sleeves to equal length and I am weighing my fiber. Fingers crossed for me, please, that I have enough fiber to finish this so it looks put together and not kind of higgledy-piggledy. Uh, and I don't have to spin another skein to match 
you know what I'm working on. I also discovered about that sweater. I've been working on interchangeable needles from um, Audi and or Adi. Oh, anyway. My Adi turbos, not my Audi turbos. Whoa. Um, and I've noticed that um, I've got uh, a nine, a US nine, and a US ten. Everything seems to be working out. I'm just going to continue to move forward. Um, as you may know, I don't like a tight sleeve, so I have not followed the pattern for this particular piece. Um, I've only done three decreases. I've kept it very loose down by the wrist, and I don't like it when I put my sweaters on and it's super tight around the layer underneath. Um, and now I need to decide if I'm gonna do a garter stitch cuff or a ribbed cuff. And in thinking about that and thinking about the amount of yarn I have left, I'm probably going to end up doing a ribbed cuff just to make sure that I have enough yarn uh, to finish. So that is the Cardin by Jennifer Wood. And then the Fox sweater, I have finished all of the patterning motif uh, for the body and I am working on the hem, which I am doing in garter stitch. Some of you have asked in the past if I... Um, go down a needle size and I tend not, I, I don't, I, I guess I don't even think about that. So it is something for me to consider. I appreciate you kind of throwing that into my um, thought process. But, uh, but for now, I've just started to work on the garter stitch. That's the knitting. When that cardin sweater is finished, we get to talk about a whole new cast on. And with any luck, um, that might go a little bit faster. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, there's also spinning to be done. Um, what's coming up for the podcast in the next couple of months? Well, I've got a bunch of dyeing I'm going to be doing. I've talked to you a little bit about my interest in shibori. I ordered a indigo vat kit. I want to do some more cyanotypes on fabric. I ordered some walnut paste to dye some fabrics to go with the, cyano pa um, the cyanotypes. So I've got a lot going on, like I said, in the surface design piece. I'm also taking a class with my mom um, on encaustic wax, and we purchased this online from um, an encaustic wax artist, uh, Sherry uh, Replogue. I will put a link uh, to her work. And so it's a self-paced course and we got some materials to do some encaustic wax collage. Now I had a viewer who had brought this to my attention, I don't know, maybe a year ago, thank you to whoever you were. And it entered in and I looked at some Pinterest items and I was very curious about it. But it really wasn't until I found the cyanotypes and then Sherry's work that encaustic wax started to make more sense. A lot of what I was work looking at was encaustic wax painting. And this is a completely different, um, I think she does some of that, but this is a different way of using the collage aspect of um, encaustic wax. And all encaustic wax is is beeswax and there is a demerarin resin added to it, which helps harden it. And it just creates a finish on your piece. Um, and there's a way also to embed uh, items and so anyway I'm looking forward to that my mom is having surgery I'm headed down actually right after I finish here uh, and so this was part of kind of you know uh, when you're done we're gonna do this and so we're gonna do some cyanotypes and collaging and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you um, depending on how my mom's feeling I would love to record that experience for my mom for the patrons of this podcast thank you ever so much um, and, and share our kind of discoveries with you all over on the Patreon page. If you're not familiar, I do have a Patreon account where you can um, uh, contribute financially. I ask for $3 per episode. Sometimes I do two episodes, sometimes I do one episode per month. Uh, so it'll never be really more than $6. And I've started adding a bonus video over there for, my, um, uh, for that community. Right. What else do I have to tell you? I feel like it's a bit of a whirlwind and ironically, here I am getting ready to pack and out the door. Uh, and luckily I'm not commuting down for work um, and I will be able to get grounded in my parents' space and, um, and just rest easy. The other thing I'm looking forward to is going to Walgreens. I don't know if you can see this, these awful glasses. Um, they fell off my head and cracked and I've had to put tape here and the lens keeps popping out. 
So instead of being kind of that nerd crone uh, with the taped glasses, I'm gonna try to pick up a new set. We do not have a drugstore in town, um, and I have a, a couple other items I'd like to get while I'm south. So it's all gonna work out, um, even though there is a bit of a drive. Last and not least, I wanted to mention a couple podcasts I've really been enjoying um, and also other resources that have been offering classes. The first one is the Nitty Stew podcast. She is based out of Calgary, I believe, um, and she is uh, she works um, in the airline industry. And so she's always in different areas and bringing different um, content from different cities, uh, primarily in Canada. And I've really been enjoying her and her aesthetic. She was knitting on haps. She's a fan of Jameson's and uh, Smith. So uh, she kind of fit into what I like to see and what people are working on um, with those types of materials. I've also been subscribed to Long Thread Media, which um, operates handwoven and spin-off and uh, what's that third one? Um, Oh, tiny pieces, something like that. They also off, um, do tiny looms. Uh, but with my subscription, I get a digital copy, a digital copy of all of those publications. But I also get to access all of their courses. I originally bought a tablet weaving course from them, and then with the subscription, I have been able to watch um, content on um, natural dyeing. Uh, weaving, there's a bunch of spinning content, um, and so I've primarily been targeting the weaving content because we moved our loom, the big four harness loom, inside, um, and we're going to get that warped. So that's coming too! So much to get done this summer as I kind of prepare for the next year where I'll be back to commuting, and I would like a lot of this stuff kind of in, uh, in place, uh, ready to go just to be able to sit down and not have to... Um, worry about getting tucked into projects that I keep having to leave. So lots to look forward to here. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. I don't know what we'll be up to. Sky's the limit when I get back uh, from south and uh, there could be weaving and dyeing and needle felting and acoustic waxing and of collage and all sorts of stuff. So again, thank you so much. A deep heartfelt thank you to those that contribute financially. I always enjoy reading your comments, your insight, uh, your investment of time here means a lot and it's encouraging. In the meantime, I hope wherever your fiber treks may take you, may you return home safe and with lots of soulful stash. I'll see you next time. Fond wishes. <laughs>